welcome back. Hey, Stanley. Yeah, George. How would you like your own TV show? Hey, hey, I got something to mail you out. Oh, you be careful now, you hear? Before you go and say something you're going to regret for the rest of your days. Like what? Like the wrong key died? Oh, no! Hey, everybody, welcome to this episode of The Wrong Podcast Died. I'm Brian, here with Rodzilla. Rodzilla. <laughs> Oh boy. You're going to have a new uh, next episode. I'll have to find another nickname for you. Just a new one every Hot Rod now Rodzilla. Okay, it sounds good. Hey everybody. On this episode, we're traveling back to February 26, 1988, right? April 29th, 1988 is what I found, but that could be wrong. I don't know. That's what it said I think on IMDb, but that's cool. Well, somebody's wrong and somebody's right, but we're going back to 1988 and we're taking a little trip overseas with Canon Films. Ooh, love Canon to hong kong right yes hong kong with the movie blood sport maybe they got kicked in the head whoever like works at imdb got kicked in the head and they're like put the wrong date in that could have happened who knows jean-claude van damme the guy from nerds yeah donald gibb the love interest is leah Ayers. um you even got forrest whittaker's in there as like um I, I don't know it's some kind of uh cia fbi agent yeah trying to get him and then there's the actor bolo young who plays the uh, villain in this so Frank Dukes, based on a true story. And actually, this is Rod's episode because Rod was like, do not look up anything about this movie because I am in this fucking rabbit hole that I'm staying up all night and then going to work, finding information out about this movie. And the more I read, the crazier this shit gets. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that later about Frank Dukes. It's freaking insane. And you don't know what's true and what's not. But a uh, little synopsis on this is uh, after the loss of his sensei's son, Frank Dukes sets off on a journey to Hong Kong to take part in the secret tournament known as the Kumite in order to bring honor to his mentor, Shidoshi Senso Tanaka. So Frank is uh, an American kid. Actually, he's a Canadian-American. His, his family moved to California, maybe, or something like that, where he... At one point, he, the sensei talks about leaving Hong Kong or, and coming to America to get away from the war. And now he lost his family. But I forgot how much this fucking movie is not the Kumite. It's not the tournament. I was like, what is going on here? I haven't watched it in so long. A lot of filler. The way it started off, is that uh, Frank, as a kid, a teenager, him and some friends break into uh, Tanaka's house and they were going to try to steal his uh, samurai sword, his katana. And, well, Frank doesn't run, the rest of them do, and he gets caught and he gets his ass kicked by this little Asian kid. (laughs) He gets one swift kick to the chops and he goes down. The sound was off. Did you notice that? Or was it just... There was some, like, are you talking about when young Frank talks? It's like they dubbed it or something. So I watched this on Tubi. It's free with commercials. And I'm almost to the point where if I don't own it on physical media and I watch it on Tubi, it's fun because I'm like watching it on late night TV because then a commercial will pop on. I'm like, oh, fuck, this is like watching it on Showtime or Cinemax or whatever it would have been on back in the day. And you get that canon opening. And you know, if it was in the 80s and that canon opening hit, you were in for a fucking good time. Love canon. This is amazing. Wish it would have stayed, but oh well. Yeah, so you start off that movie where he gets caught and then he convinces Tanaka to train him. He talks to uh, Frank's parents and then they're training. One thing that always got me is like he's sparring with the little kid and he's, he's getting his ass whooped. And one thing that the kid says, Shingo is his name. Why don't you quit, round eye? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would not go on a movie today. I'm surprised it was on this movie because, you know, there's a lot of movies getting cut up, yeah. you know, by companies and censored. That's why physical media is so important, even if you don't want to be called a round eye. It's because, oh, God. yeah, I mean, it's artwork, it's history, it's a part of culture. We can't forget those things but because we will repeat them. Yes. And we would not have Jean Claude Van Damme if it wasn't for this movie this was his breakthrough movie so i wonder what he did after this do we know um i don't know if it was lionheart something like that after another scene is when he's still a kid and shingo's getting his ass kicked at school for some reason because there's multiple kids beating him up and frank comes in and saves him and then you look in the background at one of the gawker 
kids and he's got a Bartles and James shirt on. It's like, <laughs> what school allows that shit? Like even in the, the 80s, they frowned upon that crap. Well, it would have been before the 80s because this film was released in the 80s. But when was Frank Dukes fighting in the Kumite? The, the Kumite, he claims 1975 yeah. is what I believe it was. Yeah. And then, yeah, it would have been like the 60s, probably like late 60s or at least. So after this movie was Kickboxer, Lionheart, Double Impact, Hard Target, Universal Soldier. Oh, yes. Yeah, just great. Jean-Claude Van Damme kicking people's ass, doing karate or whatever, you know, form of martial art that this movie, maybe a little different in this movie than most of his other stuff. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Because he didn't choreograph this. The actual Frank Dukes was the choreographer of this. So he had to learn some stuff from him, but he was already an accomplished kickboxer and karate champion like he's he's legit john claude is we'll get to frank dukes later but john claude is definitely he, he's done some stuff but then a few things that i got kumite is when i looked this up it's actually just japanese for sparring they, it's like the big kumite it's it's a secretive event that is usually sponsored by somebody illegal. Um, since it's in Hong Kong, from what I, what I understood, it was the triad that uh, sponsored this. What I get into, so Frank is in the military, and he decides he's going to, he hears about the Kumite. Military knows he's going, but he runs away. Basically, sort of a wall in a way. He goes to his sensei, Tanaka, and he trains some more with him, telling him he wants to be in the Kumite. And he's, Tanaka tells him, you have to train harder because you're not ready. So <laughs> goes into that and that's where you, you get the first split in this movie he does the splits uh, according to imdb seven times lord <laughs> what do you meet he's overseas he meets i'm um, the guy from revenge of the nerd jackson is the guy's last name yeah and at one point you know they play the old karate game from i think that was on nintendo too so yeah. that was in the 80s sometime that they played that so they took liberties yeah they took some liberties they have to make it you know exciting and fun jackson sees him doing the splits and he's like man you better quit doing that if you want to have kids someday you know and of course they go to the kumite you know they slowly dwindle down the fighters but the one thing i, rem- I remember at the kumite is that when you get there you have to show your invitation and then he tells them that he's with the tanaka clan and they they don't believe him because he's basically a white guy and they they tell him show us it's called dimak and it translates as death touch and because he's supposed to know this this is their move so they have a stack of bricks like four Four high, I believe, four or five high, and they tell him his sponsor tells him, "Oh, break the top one there." And then they, the judges or whatever, tell him, "No, break the bottom one without breaking any others." And then he does his little move, and he does it, and, and that's where it comes into one of my favorite lines from the villain played by Bolo is uh, his name is Chong Li, and he says, "Very good, but brick not hit back." They, there's a few lines. There's not as many as Walk Hard, but this has got a few of them in there that are kind of funny. Yeah, he's a great heavy though. He's a great bad guy. He looks looks like he would be a, and he probably is a martial artist he looks the part he acts the part the acting there was some parts that i was like okay that kick didn't look the greatest but it looked good but there's a lot before you get to the kumite and maybe not as much kumite because it's only maybe an hour and a half hour and 32 minutes long the movie yeah, because there's parts where you got military guys or wherever they are, Whitaker and this other dude that are asking Tanaka's family, where where did Frank go? And they get to Hong Kong and they talk to the police there and they go show him a picture and say, hey, you see this guy, give us a holler and we'll come. And yeah, there's there's quite a bit coming up to it. Um, so the part where he meets the love interest and she's just a reporter trying to get information on the Kumite, but she can't because it's a secret. Nobody's supposed to talk about it. And she keeps talking to these guys on there and they just won't tell her shit and then she meets this one called Hussein or Hussein and he's more he looks like he's Arab or something like that basically he's gonna take her home with him and Frank jumps in here and tells him hey we can't fight outside the Kumite so here I'll, if you can take this coin I'll put it in your palm and if you grab it before I can grab it from you then the girl's yours if not she's mine <laughs> she don't want nothing to do with that because she doesn't nobody really thinks he can do it and he actually switches the coin right and you can see if you like I was watching the, my DVD and you could see there's just a slight motion that there's no way he did it but there's a slight motion that you could see yeah so some fun stuff like that throughout the shower scene where he escapes um, the scene where they're at the hotel the CIA or the mill I would imagine they're secret military he's got to be some special forces some Mulder and Scully kind of stuff going on there you know X-Files 
where they've invested a shit ton of money in him. They don't want him hurting the Kumite and they know that people die and people get their legs broke. People get, you know, severely injured. So they're worried that he will go to this and be injured and not be any good to the military. But of course, Jackson tackles them. They have like old stun guns. Yeah. 50,000 votes or something. It's like, you're going to fucking kill him. Yeah. Why, why would you do that? You got him to bring him back home. Why do you want to kill him? But some interesting fighting styles in the movie. You know, a lot of martial arts, some kickboxing, like a guy that maybe just a heavy, a sumo, a bigger guy that just uses brute force. That's what Jackson kind of is. I don't know what his style would even be. His is just like street fighting is what it seems like. The cool one is the guy that kind of does like the jungle style where he's on all fours and he does a lot of flips and rolls and stuff. I don't even know what you would call that. Drunken monkey? Yeah, or kind of like a street fighter. You know, the street fighter games. He's kind of like Barack or Baraka. Yeah, the green dude with the red mullet. If you watched early UFC, a lot of the same matchups as this. So I wonder if somehow the early people in UFC knew about the Kumite and went to the Kumite and was like, okay, we can bring this to the States and put it in a cage and have some rules. Because it didn't seem like in the Kumite there was any rule. Right. I don't even know why there was a ref in there. Because basically you either knock them out, you make them uh, submit by saying Mate, or you knock them out of the ring. And those were the three ways to win. And I don't even know why there was a ref in there. Because he just kind of gets in the way the whole time. You know, so you get the, there's a little story sprinkled out. There's a little love interest sprinkled in there for fuck's sake. Who knows why to have a pretty girl in the movie? Pre- pretty much. She's very attractive and not like overly attractive though. Like almost real attractive. You know what I mean? Like, and there was no nudity in this film. Oh, well. Well. There's what's said when Frank actually gets with her, you see Frank's ass. You see Van Damme's ass. Okay, wow. Well, that is it though. A lot of man meat in the movies we've picked these <laughs> first two. What, what's wrong? <laughs> Whatever. To each their own. I mean, yeah, I didn't even remember seeing Frank's ass, but sure. I'm sorry. I, I just remember these things. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's a nice ass. He's an attractive gentleman. I mean, he's very muscular in this movie. He looks like he's fucking works out 23 hours a day, and I look like I work out 23 seconds a year. You know, I, I actually was watching a YouTube video with uh, Van Damme from not that long ago, talking to a podcast about this movie, and he was saying, like, he had nothing. He went to, I think, the producer or somebody, and telling him, I'll do anything, you know, give me something. And the producer, according to Van Damme, goes, okay, do you want some milk? Yes. Want some cookies? Yes. And then he, he plops down the script for Bloodsport at him, and then he flicks at it, he goes, yes, I want this. And he just went from there. That movie actually didn't get released until a few, like a year or two later, though. I think he, he said he only made 25000 out of it. On Bloodsport? Bloodsport, yeah. Really? Huh. At least that's what he said in that interview. Hopefully he's made more since then. I mean, it's been released on physical media. It's kind of one of those... Those residuals, yeah. I mean, if you're a fan of UFC or professional wrestling or action movies, this would be one you'd go back and watch. It's And you may know this. You may have already looked this up, but it's got to be somewhere in the birthplace of UFC. It's, it's pretty close. The story, I'll get to it later, but there's somebody in this, the story about the real Frank Dukes who eventually helps UFC become UFC. So Jackson, when he, he does his first win, he, he knows who Chung Lee is. He stares that motherfucker down after his first win and he, he's pulling him out. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And then Chung Lee's like freaking like, what? What the fuck? What did I do to this guy? And then he just smiles like he knows this guy's stupid. <laughs> he knows. And Jackson won't listen to anybody. You know, he's like, I know what I'm doing. Frank tells him at one point, stay away from his right leg and hit him in the abdomen. That's his weak spot. Well, of course, he doesn't fucking listen and he gets his head kicked in. Chung Lee, he, uh, he set a new record on time. It was like 14 something. And then Frank's match was like next. And he fights that Hussein that he in that bar where he was trying to take the reporter chick. There was actually something interesting about that, that match, because when uh, at the end, when uh, Van Damme goes back and he elbows, that actually happened. And he knocked the guy out. Wow. That was found on IMDb. But yeah, that, that was kind of interesting. And then there was another one with the, the fat Asian dude. His name was Pomolo or Pomola. He does the splits and he punches him. And it appears like he punches him in the nuts. Actually, according to the real Frank Dukes, that actually was a punch to the bladder. It's just so close to each other, I guess. Mm, he pits his pants? <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, there was just crazy shit in that movie. Here's one of my other favorite lines is before the final match with Chung Lee, he, Chung Lee tells him, you break my record. Now I break you like I break your friend because 
Chung Lee did eventually knock out Jackson and put him in the hospital. It's just, those were some of the crazy shit. He um, breaks another fighter's leg. He kills another. Maybe it was the second to last final match or something like that. And yeah, he killed him. The judges look at him and then they turn their back on him. And that said a lot. And he just, he just kind of waves them off. He goes, I don't care. I'm, I'm like the champion. Yeah. He was like, I'm the champ. I you know, record holder. Well, not anymore, but yeah, he was the champ. He could do whatever the fuck he wants. But the things I, I was so freaking confused at was the final match. Okay. So they've had this mat the whole freaking time. They're letting the blood stay everywhere with all the blood, but it does not change. But at the end, the final fight, they raise two ends of it and make it almost into a V shape. And I was like, I've never even heard of that. It made no sense. And I tried to look up something on it and I could not find jack shit on it. It's kind of like when a, you know, a wrestling ring's always been square. Yeah. Until TNA came on and was like, let's make it six sided for no fucking reason. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it makes it a more difficult match. You have to be a more polished fighter, I would imagine, to fight with uneven ground. I guess because there's not a lot of space like in the middle there. One that makes it smaller too, maybe. It kind of does, yeah. And then the ref gets in the fucking way. <laughs> I love it. That was the same ref the whole time, though. That was kind of cool. But one of the the goofs I found that I, I didn't notice the first time I watched it was that in that final uh, fight, Van Dam. At first, he's sweaty, you know, because he's been fucking working his ass off. And it's right after he goes blind, Chung Lee throws some powder in his eyes and you know blinds him and shit. So he's sweaty. And then they cut a scene, and then he's he's like dry. Then he goes back to the season. This is the funny little things. But that's not the, the strangest thing. You, you must not have noticed this. Throughout all the fight scenes, there's a noise that keeps happening and it sounds like a meow. And I look this up in so many chat groups and lots of people think it's a meow. And then some people say it's like a bell or a, a signal, but they have no bell. There's no bell shown. The only thing close to what I could see in that arena is that some guy's got a boom box. I think maybe they're just playing some music. Okay. But yeah, there's this fucking meow and I could not get it out of my head. I thought it was my DVD. And then I went to my voodoo version and I listened and it did the same thing. I go, shit, Brian's going to listen to this on Tubi and they're going to clean that out. No, it's in there too. <laughs> oh really i didn't notice it yeah i'm like looking in the crowd and like the people kind of look fake you know because they're shaking their papers so i was like maybe they look fake maybe it's yeah i don't know you're gonna you're gonna hear it and you won't unhear it yeah i'll have to go back and watch it again to like listen it, it happens a lot like throughout the goddamn movie and it freaking annoyed me when i when i first listened to it i had my uh patio door open i thought is there a cat out there and i i paused the movie i go out there and i wait listen is it gonna happen again no so I play the movie. It happens again. So I shut the door. Fucking happens again. <laughs> Goddamn cat. Rod hasn't had pussy in so long. He's hearing cats meow in movies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm desperate that, that's pretty much most of what i got from the, the movie notes that i had like i said van damme is a confirmed kickboxing and karate champion he does this split seven freaking times and then one of the interesting things that i found was mortal Kombat character johnny cage was inspired by van damme's character of this and you could see it you see it absolutely 100 percent. you get to the end of the movie of course he goes blind he uses his sense of whatever you would call it he focuses he wins he gets the girl he goes back to the you know the states he surprises him on the plane he's like what's taking you guys so long he stands on the walkway to the plane he salutes and then we get music from 1975 to 1980, Frank W. Dukes fought 329 matches. He retired undefeated as the world heavyweight full contact Kumite champion. Mr. Dukes still holds four world records. Fastest knockout, 3.2 seconds. Fastest punch with a knockout, 0.12 seconds. Fastest kick with a knockout, 72 miles per hour. Most consecutive knockouts in a single tournament, 56. How many fucking fights do they have to have in this damn thing? Right. Right. And Lisa. when I looked into Frank Dukes a little bit more, he, so this dude, yeah, he was in the military from that, those time points, 75 to 80. And then he claims in 75, it was in the Bahamas, but he says it was a 60 round tournament. And some math guy said, this is impossible. And then if you watch a video, a YouTuber's Viking Samurai, their channel, the guy did a interview with Frank Dukes and he kind of tells him, Hey, there's this out here. They say it's impossible. Frank kind of explains 
explains a little bit of how this could be possible. Telling him, yeah, we were 20 matches the first, 20 the second, 20 the third. But then he kind of, he varies a little bit. Here's the thing with Frank Dukes. I don't think you can believe everything he said about this. Made a great movie. Great movie. But a lot of what he says, it doesn't make sense because of the, the math, how many people you would have to have. And the Bahama officials at that time said that there's no way they could have had that many people and us not notice it. That That's some of the mystery with Frank Dukes. But it's you can't prove them wrong either because it's so secretive. I mean, it's yeah. You, so it's like Jesus Christ. He has and he has pictures where he has this trophy. Some people claim that he just bought the trophy because he did articles in the '80s. Black Belt, I believe, was a, a magazine he did this for, and he did create his own uh, martial arts. Also, he calls it Duke's Rude Ninjutsu. So it's like ninja, basically, is what his style is. Some of the, the questionable things that I that claims that I thought of or i found where he released a book in 1996 called the secret man an american warriors uncensored story where he claimed to have been recruited by the cia to do covert operations so he he talked about going to nicaragua blowing shit up and things like that there's robert gates he was the 22nd united states secretary of defense from 2006 to 2011 never heard of dukes before and then he talked to the people in the cia they've never heard of it because dukes claims that the cia had him do these missions and there's no record of it. It's it's kind of crazy. If you go to the Freedom of Information Act, it shows that he never served overseas. He just served Marine Reserves, but he never served overseas because he made claims that in some of those magazines saying that he, he fought in Vietnam, but basically Vietnam was over by the time he got in the military. There wasn't much going on. So it's just more of the mystery of Frank Dukes. I almost wonder, though, it makes you think. Is half of it blowing smoke up your ass and half of it real? Even if the government says, oh, no, that never fucking happened. Okay, the same government that's been lying about fucking UFOs for 80 years. What? Oh, now it's okay. Oh, yeah, we knew about those. No big deal. UFOs all the fucking time. Since when? Oh, I don't know, 1900? You know what I mean, though? Right. You you trust anything that anybody in politics fucking tells you? Not really. Not either side. Yeah. And that's kind of what Frank says is that there's just a conspiracy. You watch that video of that Viking Samurai where he does the interview and he, he talks about like, you're not going to find out any of this stuff until I'm dead. Then it may be released because it'd be worth something to him. Well, and the Kumite, even at one point during the movie, they kind of explain like you're in Hong Kong, but when you cross over into this, you're not anywhere. You're kind of like in a different world. Right. So, and I would admit there's a lot of stuff like that. Continue news today that you know epstein island not to be political but there's a lot of places in this world that you go and your phone don't matter your status don't matter nothing matters because it's so secretive and back then there was no internet there was no cell phones you know you probably got your invitation on a fucking piece of paper folded in a napkin or some shit right some more of the stuff with, with frank dukes though was like he claimed to have a medal of honor i don't know what from but there's a photo of him in a uniform where it shows him with these service ribbons from what people have said that have been in the military is that they're not in the correct order and that the medal of honor that he was wearing was actually from the united states army and not from the marine reserves there's and then there here's the other thing that may shine a little bit of light on it back in january of 78 he was referred uh for psychiatric evaluation after he expressed a flighty and disconnected ideals they basically had him go see a shrink i'd never found anything more about that i'm sure if i dug deeper i would find a lot because today i was even finding a lot of shit from him you know what i i did i worked two years on a psychiatric unit outside of chicago and almost always probably 99 percent of the time anybody that had any kind of issues it was always some line of reality in it there was always some line of like a reason? Like a reason, or you're looking at it differently, but let's just say there was a, a lady that said someone was stealing their clothes and wearing them. The neighbor's stealing my clothes and wearing them. Okay, so what's really happening? Well, the neighbor wasn't stealing that person's clothes. The neighbor was a cross-dresser and dressed exactly like her. So, you know what I mean? Like, right. okay. Or let's say like, oh, the government's watching me. Well, is the government really watching you? Well, maybe not, but maybe they are. Because maybe this person, there was a place 
place outside of Chicago that did biochemical engineering. And guess where that person worked? At the Biochemical Federal Reserve Plant. So is the government watching you? Well, probably they fucking are, but maybe not like you think they're watching you. You know what I mean? Right. So like there's always that line of, is Frank blowing smoke up your ass? 99% of it's probably yes. Or maybe he's just a really good fucking actor that probably went and like, you know, because here where I live, there used to be an army surplus store and you could go buy all kinds of army fatigues and clothes and medals and stuff and boots and you could make a whole army outfit out of it. It's proven that he, he was in the military. Yeah. There is proof there. But yeah, like I said, he started his own martial arts. He has his own school. As far as I know, it's still going. There's some funny things that come out of that because there was a guy named Zane Frazier who worked for him, but he never paid him. In 1993, they met up at some event and they got in a fight. Two witnesses to this. There's Rorian Gracie, who was from the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu family. Very famous, very well-respected. And then a guy named Art Davies, who I sort of hinted to, he helped create the UFC. He was uh, asked to help out at the beginning. So they witnessed this and they claim that Frazier kicked his ass. And then, you know, after some time, Dukes actually claimed that Frazier sucker punched him with brass knuckles, but nobody's seen these brass knuckles when they were in the fight. This is where some of the mystery goes, where he's trying to make excuses. And then you kind of went into this a little bit too. With So in 1980 is where he had his big article in the Black Belt magazine. And that's where he first, he claims he had 321 wins, one loss and seven draws and then in 2014 he changes it he stated on axs tv that he retired with 329 wins and zero losses and they don't talk about any draws maybe I and mean, if you added those loss and that and those draws it would be 329 wins here was something interesting i found out today steven seagal hates Frank Dukes. Well, everybody hates Steven Seagal, so it's one against the fucking world, Steven. You're you're a douchebag. Everybody, even your own kids think that. They do. When Frank had his, he had his classes, he claimed that a man came in and offered him $25,000 to take out Steven Seagal. <laughs> he talks about it in that, that Viking Samurai YouTube video, too. Check it out. It's it's crazy. It's probably, I think, like a, maybe 30-some minutes. I got $46, Frank. Let's do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then Frank says he's he came to Steven Seagal and he told him about this. And I'm trying to think of what her name was that was in Weird Science. The actress from Weird Science? Yeah, Steven Seagal was dating her at the time. What Frank thought was that maybe it was her boyfriend or her husband at the time. And he was trying to have Steven Seagal taken out. And he thought Frank Dukes was the guy. That's a Kelly LeBrock from, she played Lisa, you know, the one that they create on the movie. Frank said he came to him and told him about this and that him and Steven were friends, but Steven Seagal has never said a good thing about Frank Dukes. He says because Frank technically claims he's a ninja in a way with ninjutsu, and Steven goes, that's not a real martial arts. What's not a real martial art? Being a ninja? <laughs> Being a ninja, yes. And Dukes' teacher was a guy named, he claimed to be Tanaka, and it was funny because when he brings up this name, it's actually a, a name of a character from a Bond movie. And the way Frank kind of rebuttals this, like he goes, when somebody brings this up to him, he goes, yeah, they used to use those names of real martial arts guys all the time. And that's how he gets by with this stuff. And it's the mystique. It's it's really fun. Listen to some of it. But then you got to call bullshit on, on it. The craziest part about all of this is the true story would probably be better than the fucking movie. It probably would. You know what I mean? Like if you're like, oh, look, that's Steven fucking Seagal and Kelly LeBrock. And Frank's going to kick his ass but he doesn't you know what i mean right then he's on the shows and he's you know like the true story of all this would be better than any fucking movie but it did make a pretty good movie yeah it, it was because yeah this one blood sport the budget was 1.1 million it made 11.8 million worldwide in the year 1988 it was only the 87th movie overall from how much it made that same week that it came out colors the movie about uh gangs in la was number one they it made six point five and with blood sport coming in about number seven at one point nine million. Then we get, you know, some sports. Mara Lemieux wins the scoring title, breaking Wayne Gretzky's seven year streak. That's early in April. Um, you know, the men's basketball tournament is ending. March Madness is ending, you know, with Kansas Jayhawks defeating the Oklahoma Sooners. Eighty three to seventy nine. That was a pretty close game. Uh, maybe it wasn't close at the end, but you never know with basketball. April 29th, the Baltimore Orioles end a twenty one game losing streak, defeating the Chicago 
Chicago White Sox, nine to nothing. The Orioles are still beating the White Sox. That's not changed. What do you got for music? Anything exciting? Number one song at that time, that during that week that the movie came out, was from Whitney Houston, Where Do Broken Hearts Go? That I remember. I remember that song. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. They go to Rod's house. They go to my house. They live at Rod's house. The uh, country music star, Randy Travis, he wins in the TNN Viewer's Choice Awards. He wins five categories that he was in, including TNN's favorite entertainer voted by the fans. He beat out Reba McIntyre, Dolly Parton, Ricky Skaggs, George Strait, and Hank Williams Jr. Damn. Half them people are still touring. What about uh, Aloha Airlines Flight 243's roof tears off and mid-flight killing one stewardess? That's... I'm sorry if she died or he died. Maybe it was male. But only one person died in the whole... That's interesting to me that only one person... Yeah, I didn't see much more about it. I, I looked into it a little bit and yeah, all it talked about was that I think there was a name. I, I didn't catch the name. I probably should have took the name. But yeah, just one person and this maybe the seatbelt sign was on and everybody was okay. It it, it could have been, yeah. And they, maybe they weren't as high up as could have been. I think if you get pulled out of the airplane, no matter how high you are, your ass is dead when you hit Right. The Around that time too, speaking of air flights, the there was a federal smoking ban on domestic flights of two hours or less. So if you were just going from let's say Des Moines to Chicago, you couldn't smoke. You couldn't smoke. Huh. Here we go. This is right up our alley because we're both fat and love to eat. April 30th, the largest banana split of 4.5 miles long was made along Market Street in some town in Pennsylvania, and I'm not even going to fucking try. And they held the record for 29 years until March 25th, 2017, and some town I'm not even going to try to say in Australia beat it with 4.9 mile long banana split. Still holds the record from what I've heard. Really? A lot of fucking bananas, ain't it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Just think of what one mile of banana would be i mean oh my god and you would have to raid every grocery store in town to... by the time you got started and done the bananas at the beginning would be brown and you wouldn't fuck be able to eat them right <laughs> exactly yes yeah. about the time walmart opens his first super center in washington missouri and we had talked about this and you're like walmart's an arkansas based store yeah and you work at walmart and i've worked at walmart we've all had our time at walmart we've done our walmart time so that's interesting we figured maybe taxes or the store was due for a remodel or a rebuild so they're like oh this store's due let's try it here i don't know why they did it there maybe who the fuck knows with walmart a lot of things was at walmart it seems like they want a central point where it's around a lot of even small towns so that they could pull people in that's why usually most walmarts are about 30 miles apart or so tv cosby show was the most popular show not so much anymore is that still on reruns i feel like they'll show it i think so i mean i i wonder if it's on pluto at all i'll have to check it out and see if i can find it pluto after dark and then uh 48 hours premiered on CBS, and I think that's still around. What do you got for toys? Anything exciting? This isn't the year that it came out, but the NES was still the number one toy of that year. And then you had Micro Machines uh, hit shelves and took off that year. They're still kind of around. You can still find some Micro Machines. You had the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures. Barbie was still very popular, still to the day. It's got a movie out now. And then there was a, a Dolly Surprise that uh, was one of the top toys of that year, too. What was the surprise? Probably pissed herself. Surprise! Clean it up! Surprise! Yeah, you thought you were getting rid of a baby. Here's another one. And it's interesting. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a movie this last year. Barbie, a movie this last year. And Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will have another movie coming, I think, next year. This year and next year, they'll do another one. And that was fun. That was kind of a horror kind of bled into that one a little bit. Did you see the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? Ronin. So yeah. No. Oh no, I haven't seen the newest one yet. Nope, I haven't seen it. Yeah, that. the animated one. Um, They're mutated. They're all mutated. Like, but maybe a little more horrific than the ones with the, the live action ones. But yeah, the live action Ronin one will be the first R-rated one. So that one's, you know, will be fun. Yeah, I remember Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, when the, the first movie came out. My mom took me and my sisters to go get some pizza and we stopped at the candy store and I bought some in M&M's, you know, and uh, put my M&M's on my pizza because I saw it on that cartoon. Was it? the greatest though so we uh last episode i told a joke and this episode we actually had a fan of the show send in a joke oh nice it's our friend bill fisher comedian bill fisher oh so we're gonna we're gonna play that i was gonna repeat it but i think i could just play it he, he's not in the bathroom stall is he uh i'm not sure isn't he always so, looks like there's bricks in the background so i don't know here we go so this guy gets in an accident 
loses four fingers from one hand, goes to the doctor. He says, Doc, I know it's bad, but will I at least be able to drive with this hand? The doctor says, mm, maybe, but I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a second just to freaking figure out. Oh fuck yeah. yeah, he lost his fingers. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that was from Bill. Thanks, Bill, for the the joke. I have a few here. Do Do you want to hear a Chuck Norris joke or a dirty joke? Oh, let's go with Chuck Norris. Let's save the dirty joke for next episode. Just since 1940, the year Chuck Norris was born, Brown's House kicks related deaths have increased 13,000 percent. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then Chuck Norris Roundhouse kicked nothing and told it to get a job. Chuck Norris's tears cure cancer. Too bad he has never cried. Uh, that was a good one, yeah. Except for the people that have cancer. I know. That's really sad. Jesus, Chuck. Do us all a favor. Cry a little bit, buddy. Cry. Tears of joy. Cry a little bit. We we still have not come up with a system on rating movies. But like I said earlier, I think if you like um, professional wrestling, UFC, action movies, true stories, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Nobody knows. It's a mystery. If you like mysteries, you can throw that on there too. You should check out Bloodsport. Probably one of the the best action films of the late '80s. There, especially of Canon. Canon's one of their top ones, I think. What do you think? Um, no, you go first. Did we rate last? Did time? you gave you gave uh, Walk Hard a five? I gave it a four. I, I almost feel like my my rating is gonna be the same here. It's like four out of five. Like same thing with Walk Hard. Very rewatchable. Great movie. Lots of movies I think took from it later on. I think I will go four out of five gold tooths on the mat you know where he grabs the tooth and he bites it and he's happy yeah he's happy it's a happy janitor so check out blood sport and i think next episode we're gonna go to the 90s should we tell them what we're gonna watch go for it oh uh, we're gonna do clueless so we're gonna go way out of our comfort zone because you said you don't think you've ever seen it all the way through i don't think i've seen it completely i haven't seen it for a long time it has alicia silverstone and paul rudd so that's always fun but it's from the 90s and we've done 2000 and we've done the 80s so we're gonna go to the 90s and we're gonna go outside of our comfort zone because this is a more female centered comedy i would imagine you're so called uh chick flick yeah kind of but but not most of these movies would be canceled if they watched them or filmed them today so all right we'll catch you next time bye that marks the end of our broadcast day here at The Wrong Podcast Died. Our transmission is powered by a frequency of 800 watts. We will resume our usual programming in two weeks. Until then, we bid you good night. <laughs>